what I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about um, in, in terms of a first episode psychosis is looking at effective outreach. This is one of the things that um, we, we're often talking about is a, is a struggle. Um, and then there are oftentimes successes that some teams experience. But um, I just wanted to kind of go through um, some different ideas, um, suggestions, things to consider um, with regard to uh, completing outreach and, and completing effective outreach at that. Um, so the first thing uh, is that regarding an article um, that came about, what this article highlighted was the use of information campaigns. And the way that they identified the information campaigns was it was kind of like a mass media um, type of a outreach effort. So they did TV commercials, they did um, little commercials that popped up on the screens at movie theaters between movies or before movies, I should say. Um, and so they had just this huge outreach effort. And what this article specifically did was it did follow up to um, an initial research study that was done to show how effective was this outreach um, and the outreach effort with relationship to the duration of untreated psychosis. And so what they found was that this information campaign was incredibly effective um, with regard to reducing the duration of untreated psychosis. I believe that the study found that it was somewhere around five or six weeks they got it reduced down in this specific um, cohort of individuals um, down to five or six weeks, which was incredibly effective and it was beneficial for the team involved, uh, multiple teams that were involved. So what this study did was they wanted to do a follow-up on that um, because their thinking was, well, this information campaign or to the intensity that this information campaign was done, um, it couldn't have gone on forever for a number of reasons, financial reasons, time, staff, all of those things to be considered. Um, and so what they found um, initially um, with, re oh, let me back up. Um, and so what they found was that, that the initial, it initially led to the reduction of the duration of untreated psychosis. And then what they found was um, as part of this study was once that information campaign was stopped or it was discontinued, what they found was what they found was that the um, there was an increase, um, a clear um, regression of individuals seeking help. There was an increase in the duration of untreated psychosis in the time following when that information campaign started um, or finished. And so it's something important to keep in mind when you think about with regard to your programs is. Um, you know, it, it, how important is it? Uh, and not only how important is it when you're starting up a program or that you're, you know, maybe trying to get more people into your program, um, but it's also important to make it, a, it to the best of your ability to make it a continuous effort um, because there's evidence to suggest that once it's stopped, um, the, the number of referrals or the number uh, of individuals coming into the program is going to decrease dramatically. And I think we would all recognize that. Um, and, and I think. Um, we can recognize that the benefit of, of continuing outreach efforts and finding good ways to make sure that the team is doing that um, can continue. So one of the things that I wanted to um, kind of go over with regard to um, outreach is talking a little bit about public, public education, targeted outreach. So identifying within your team, um, what are some places that you would want to um, complete outreach? And we're going to talk about that a little bit here as well. Um, but it, it has multiple benefits. It increases the uh, uh, um, awareness of the FEP program, also increases the awareness of not only just the FEP program, but mental health care in general. Um, you know, most teams, uh, first episode teams, and I think this is pretty consistent uh, across the country, most first episode teams are part of a broader, larger agency. Um, and so oftentimes, the effort to educate the community on first episode psychosis can also be an opportunity to educate on other types of mental health treatment um, that may be available within your agency. So the idea of uh, getting individuals into treatment promptly and effectively, not only for the FEP program, but also for um, all types of mental health care. So as I mentioned, most of the time, um, FEP programs are part of a larger entity, a larger agency. And um, one of the most important things is to make sure that everyone within your agency is aware of the program. I know uh, in working with some of the teams, 
uh, a large majority of the referrals that come into their program are coming from within their agency, coming from um, you know, crisis units, could be coming from general assessment uh, departments, um, all kinds of things. And so keeping in mind, making sure on a regular basis that you're, all of your internal stakeholders are aware of the program and aware of the process of referring someone um, so that there's not any kind of lost time from getting an individual into treatment to then getting them to um, the appropriate uh, first episode program. And as I'm sure most of you are all aware, um, turnover within staff and within agencies happens quite frequently. And so we want to be very mindful, right, to not just assume, hey, I went and talked with this department, you know, a year ago, they're all well aware. Um, the odds are that within that year time, there's probably a lot of new people, new faces um, that have started working within that department. This is not only just for internal referrals um, or internal uh, sources, but also um, external ones as well. Just the turnover of staff is always something um, to keep in mind. So a couple of things, we're going to kind of look at suggestions. So a couple of things is, is having a presence on agency websites, dedicated websites for the program. If you have the ability to do that, I think that would be really good. Um, one of the things that I did over the course of, of developing this PowerPoint was I, I gathered some research about how people get their information. And so it should come as no surprise that everybody, I shouldn't say that, two-thirds of individuals get their information from social media sites. And not only do they get their information, but they get their news, they get everything that kind of, um, that they kind of get all of their information from is the social media sites, specifically Facebook. Um, and so if your program or your agency has the ability to um, um, highlight the FEP program on a Facebook um, or other social media sites, it can be incredibly effective um, because that's where people are getting their information. Um, they're not getting information from watching the news at night. Um, and one of the other things that I found that was really interesting is that um, a lot of individuals that are kind of what they would call consider themselves to be YouTube users, um, over half of those individuals are getting their information from YouTube. Um, so they're not Again, they're not watching the news, they're not reading the newspapers, although that's you know, maybe an outdated thing as well. Um, but the idea is to think about that when completing outreach, is to think about within your community, um, is putting an ad or information in the newspaper about the program the most effective way? Uh, because odds are within your community, there might not be a lot of people who are reading the newspaper anymore. Um, would putting a, a information on the um, uh, on the t local TV channel, is that going to be effective? Um, and kind of consider that as you're moving forward in, with your outreach efforts. Okay, so then we're going to talk a little bit about specific types of areas. If we kind of look at outreach areas more specifically within the criminal justice system, so we're talking about jails, specialty courts, or problem-solving courts, whatever they might be, um, considered in your community. So drug courts, mental health courts, um, some, some areas and communities have veterans courts, um, making sure that they're aware of the program as well. Um, prosecutors and public defenders offices can be incredibly important as well. Uh, public defenders offices, it kind of stands to reason, but also prosecutors offices because not everybody who is going to be going through the court system might have representation from the public defender's office. They might retain private counsel, and so they might not have that information. So the hope would be going through a prosecutor and educating the prosecutor on um, the program could certainly help as well. Um, and then also uh, within police departments, CIT teams, you know, making sure uh, that they're aware of the program as well. And, and a lot of CIT teams have regular, I don't know, like uh, meetings or um, presentations or education types opportunities and so uh, that might be a good opportunity for someone on the team to be able to go and, and talk with the team uh, the CIT team um, about the program and specifically um, what they can do if they come into contact with someone um, this was a really interesting topic that was in and I, this um, site and I can certainly give it to Jamie um, that she could pass along to you guys well as well this was an information brief that was um, provided by NASHMID um, last year, um, and it, it just kind of breaks down what they've heard from various teams and, and different things, so um, I can certainly pass this along to Jamie, but one of the things that I found really interesting with schools is 
um, you know, obviously we talk about teachers, we talk about, you know, guidance counselors, social workers within the department, uh, within the school system, but also thinking about student groups that might be present. Um, and what they found is that a lot of student groups are very receptive um, to having individuals come in and talk with their club or their group or whatever it might be um, in, in terms of educating them on the program. One of the things that was really interesting with this as well um, is one of the programs talked about with the, the, the college, the local college that they that was in their area, their catchment area. And what they did was they went to a store, a grocery store, and they got donated ramen noodle packages. And what they did was they got stickers for their program, they put them onto the ramen noodle package, and when they went to the freshman orientation for that college, they passed them out um, to the freshmen that were there. Very simple, very easy process, and I remember ramen noodles from back in my days. Um, and so it, it was an incredibly effective and useful way, and it was something so creative, and yet when you think about it, how simple is that to get word out um, to, to, to the local college? I thought that was a really interesting part. The other thing, too, um, that kind of goes along with that, and I think I'm going to talk about it um, within some, uh, like, job fairs. No, I, it's here, too, as well. Um, what they talked about, one program went to, um, with the student groups that they presented to, and what they found is that these fairs that they have at schools, um, where they maybe have a lot of different people from the community come in, and what they found was that a lot of students are very receptive to that, and part of it was is because they're very receptive to the candy that gets passed out. Um, again, very simple, something not very difficult to do. You put a big bowl of candy um, out on your information table, and um, de depending on the group that you might be uh, uh, there for, um, can be very effective um, in getting people to come over, and you come over and, and certainly take advantage of that time to educate them on the process as well. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's kind of the standard or what we, you know, primary types of um, referral and outreach efforts um, with psychiatric units, discharge planners, social workers within hospitals. Um, one of the things that can be incredibly effective in this environment, um, because it can be very hectic, um, individuals coming in to, to receive treatment, they're getting discharged, there's a lot happening, a lot of moving parts at any given moment. And so being able to um, provide materials that are easy to get to. Um, you know, they talked about um, providing magnets that would have information, contact information for the program that could just be put up on a filing cabinet. Um, so someone who is very busy could just look over and find the phone number um, and, and it could be relatively easy versus trying to have to, you know, go through websites or trying to find information, find somebody's business card, uh, things along those lines can certainly help as well. Primary care physicians, um, again, looking within, um, within hospitals or larger practices as well, maybe individuals that are not directly affiliated with any mental health care within a hospital, um, and uh, primary care physicians can be in incredibly effective as well. I think a lot of, of teams, from what I've heard from teams and what I've gathered as part of this PowerPoint, um, talking to primary care physicians can be incredibly difficult and be, it can be very challenging. Um, and so a lot of suggestions that they've had is, um, you know, having outreach efforts to the, the PAs or the, the nurse practitioners that are maybe working within a doctor's office um, if they're not able to work with the, or talk with the primary care physician themselves. Um, so things to consider when you're, when you're doing outreach into those areas of the community, because primary care physicians, um, more often than not, are going to have contact with individuals, um, not only mental health-wise, but also uh, that may be experiencing a first episode of psychosis. And so whether it's them or a family member. Um, some things to consider. How can you track contacting and making contact with um, potential referral sources? That's something, again, to keep in mind, a way to track so you're not trying to remember, hey, when did we last talk with this group of individuals? When, did we, when do we need to go back? Um, finding a way that's most effective for, for you and your team uh, to be able to do that. I highlighted this as well, keeping in mind turnover that occurs with referral sources. Um, and so even though the program may have been in place for years and years and years, and it's well established within the community, we want to be very mindful that there's going to be new people that are going to be working at some of these places that maybe aren't aware or weren't told about the program Take advantage of the time that you can to go to these places to educate them 
on the program and what the referral play or a referral process would look like. Um, think about non-traditional, if I can use that term, referral sources. Um, thinking about things like religious organizations. Um, uh, I, I once went to a, a workshop where they talked about program startup. And there was a lady that was there that was started up a gambling treatment program in Connecticut. And what she found was that she did all this outreach and she wasn't getting people to come in. And, and um, what she found was the best place in her community to talk about the program was the local barbershop. Um, and so what she did was she went to the barbershop, she talked about her program, and it proved to be very effective. Um, and so for your program and your community, think about where would be some of those um, maybe non-traditional um, ears to the ground resources that you might be able to utilize and go in and talk with somebody about the program because um, it can prove to be very effective. And then the last thing, I just want to encourage all of you guys and all of your teams, make outreach a team and an agency effort. Um, it, that it, it proves to be most effective when everyone is doing that. Everyone is kind of making the effort to educate the community on the program. It's not just falling on one single person. I know there's a lot of variables to consider when we talk about this. There's a lot of other things um, that can certainly come into play, productivity, things like that. Um, but when you make it a team effort, make it an agency effort. If somebody's going out to uh, uh, do a presentation or they're doing a, um, uh, 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 information table um, at maybe a, a fair or something, make sure that they have information regarding your program, whether it's a flyer, whether it's a contact number, um, whatever the case might be, um, especially if it's somebody outside of the team that's going to be doing that. Kind of look at that as a bonus or a free outreach effort um, that could be completed by someone else, um, someone that's not necessarily uh, part of the team. So there's some things to, to kind of keep in mind as well. And as part of our discussion that we'll have uh, in a little bit, we'll kind of highlight and talk a little bit about what has been some of your guys' experiences um, as far as outreach, what have been some barriers, what things have been very effective and very useful for you guys. Um, and we'll talk about some different things, especially with regard to how to track. Um, Patty, um, who is there at the Hub, um, had developed a very effective um, uh, source and a way to track um, contacting referral sources and ways to update and keep track of that information and so we can talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so just some things to kind of get us get, get you guys thinking about things, get you thinking about some topics and things that you might want to present um, as far as um, outreach efforts. Uh, oh there we go. Uh, 